today I'm going to talk to you about how uh, we're using a simple model organism to try to understand something about mitochondrial disease. So those green structures are the mitochondria that we are studying, lit up with a green fluorescent protein. And uh, above that you see the yeast that we use, which is used for baking bread and brewing beer. So at around uh, the time at which eukaryotic cells were first developing, uh, there were two prokaryotes thought to be living side by side, helping one another along. One engulfed the other, and um, that became the mitochondrion. And that prokaryotic uh, genome was reduced and reduced and reduced further. The genes were transferred to the nucleus, but still there is a relic um, DNA in the mitochondria. It's important for generation of uh, ATP. It's important for both pumping protons across the inner membrane and then using that uh, gradient to generate ATP. So we have DNA in the nucleus, as you know, and we also have uh, DNA in the mitochondria. And uh, it shouldn't be a surprise then that mitochondrial DNA mutation is associated with disease. So around one in 5,000 people uh, are born with an inherited mutation that will lead to some sort of mitochondrial disease. Uh, unfortunately, there's no cure or effective treatment for most of these disorders. And because of the role for mitochondria in bioenergetics, most of the defects that you see in these patients are, are in the nervous system and the musculature where uh, you need the most energy. Also, besides people, people's inherited mutations, during the lifetime of a, of a person, you can also take different medications, which may also promote the accumulation of mitochondrial DNA damage. So the, the drug on the left is uh, zudovidine, which is also called AZT. Uh, patients with HIV will take a drug like this drug or a drug like it. Um, and, and like I said, this can lead to long-term mitochondrial consequences. Also, the drug on the right is a drug used to treat uh, several cancers, also resulting in accumulation of mitochondrial DNA damage. If you look in, uh, so there's a, a lot of evidence in many different organisms that mitochondrial DNA damage, even if not treated with the drugs I just mentioned, uh, will accumulate uh, throughout the lifetime in, of an organism. So what you're looking at on the left are biopsies, well, throughout the figure, are biopsies taken from the portion of the brain affected in Parkinson's disease and testing how much of the mitochondrial DNA contains uh, deletions. You can see that young people have very few mitochondrial DNA mutations, and then there seems to be a critical point beyond which uh, you see a, a vast uh, accumulation of mitochondrial DNA damage. Okay. Now, is this causal for aging, or is it purely correlative? And nobody knows the answer yet, but you might be able to say that nearly all people of advanced age suffer from, suffer from some sort of mitochondrial DNA-associated disease. Okay. So the questions that we're addressing in my laboratory are, how can we better understand the biology, the basic cell biology of cells with damaged mitochondrial DNA? And the longer-term goal is, how can we find treatments for mitochondria-associated disease? And the organism that we use is, as I mentioned before, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. There are a lot of benefits to using the system, such as the genetic tractability, short generation time. You can, uh, if you want to do biochemical experiments, it's easy to isolate lots of mitochondria. Most importantly are the, is the conservation of genes and pathways re required for survival of mitochondrial DNA damage. There's, you, you often find that people working in human cells and tissues are finding 20 years after the, the yeast field uh, the same thing with regards to mitochondrial DNA damage. And um, importantly, cells can normally survive mitochondrial DNA damage, Saccharomyces cerevisiae can, yet further perturbation of mitochondrial function can kill cells lacking mitochondrial DNA. And this is a benefit for me as a geneticist because it can provide a sensitized background uh, that you can use for genetic selections so that in an unbiased way you might discover more about about this, uh, this phenomenon, okay? So what I'm gonna tell you about today is our, our focus on nutrient sensing pathways. So it shouldn't be a surprise that this organelle that is, sits at the nexus of so many, not, not just oxidative phosphorylation, but many other metabolic reactions, reactions, that its function is controlled by nutrient sensing pathways. And that mitochondrial dysfunction might also be affected uh, or, or perhaps reversed by altering these, this nutrient sensing, okay? And so I'm gonna focus on the TOR pathway, and this is uh, not only a picture of our PhD uh, qualifying committee, but also um, 
well, the reason I'm showing you this, this is Easter Island. So, as you know, micro, microorganisms are constantly at war with one another, uh, even in the soil. And uh, there's a bacteria on Easter Island. It produces a drug, a metabolite called rabamycin, that uh, also kills Saccharomyces cerevisiae cells. Okay? And uh, the pathway that this drug affects is involved in nutrient sensing, but most prominently it's been studied in the sensing of amino acids. Okay? So why, are we, why were we looking into this pathway? Well, it's an old observation from when I was a PhD student that overexpression of a TOR pathway component called TIP41, TIP which was uh, first and best characterized by Michael Hall, uh, increases the proliferation rate of cells lacking mitochondrial DNA by around 70%, which is a very substantial increase in the proliferation rate of these cells lacking mitochondrial DNA. So what does TIP41 do? So, it's a complicated pathway. I'm going to give you just a, just a snapshot, a, a, a constricted view. And that is TOR kinase is thought to activate a protein called TAP42, which is inhibited by TIP41. Okay? Downstream of TAP42 are, are a series of phosphatases, type 2 and type 2A-like phosphatases, which are conserved across many eukaryotes. Now, TAP42, it's, it's a complicated relationship with these phosphatases. It's, re it's required for both the folding of these phosphatases and later can inhibit the activity of these phosphatases. And I'm focusing mostly on the activating role of TAP42. And so if overexpression of TIP41 is supposed to inhibit TAP42 to benefit cells lacking mitochondrial DNA, then perhaps um, also reducing the function of TAP42 will give the same thing. So here we have a conditional mutation in TAP42, a partial loss of function, a temperature sensitive mutant at the semi-permissive temperature. So wild type cells lacking mitochondrial DNA, they proliferate a little more slowly than, than cells containing mitochondrial DNA, and that ATP2 mutant is a sensitized background in which we do some of our studies. They, and if you drop mitochondrial DNA from these cells, they die, okay? But if you inhibit TAP42, we suppress this effect, okay? Suggesting that, again, it's, it's consistent with what we previously found. Let's go downstream to the phosphatases. So the, this is a panel where I've deleted the different phosphatases that TAP42 controls. So what you have here are uh, conserved phosphatases. So if you're working on mammalian cells, CIT4 is protein phosphatase 6, and there's two uh, paralogous uh, catalytic subunits for pro protein phosphatase 2A. So if we delete protein phosphatase 6 or protein phosphatase 2A, again, we can suppress the death of the sensitized mutant after mitochondrial DNA loss. And there were some other type 2 phosphatases that didn't, they didn't give any effect, and we didn't study them further. You might say, what happens if you delete both? Well, the cells are dead. There's some parallel activity there. We couldn't, we couldn't figure out what the triple mutant does. So you say, well, you use the sensitized background, so you know, maybe that there's something, you know, some artifact of using this special background. So then we studied proliferation rates, just whether you have or have not the mitochondrial genome. That's what this rho plus and rho minus jargon is. And containing or lacking these phosphatases. And what you can see is that if you compare wild type rho minus cells, Okay? They're severely affected in proliferation after mitochondrial DNA loss. If you delete the fo uh, protein phosphatase 2A, you're not as severely affected. Okay? So here we're, we're taking it out of, the, out of the sensitized background and we still see a beneficial effect on cells lacking mitochondrial DNA. The CIT4 mutant's already sick, but what we can say is that if you have or have not mitochondrial DNA, there's no difference in proliferation rates, again suggesting a beneficial effect of PP6 deletion. Also in data I'm not showing you, mutations that hyperactivate these phosphatases, conversely, are harmful for cells lacking mitochondrial DNA, okay? What's the, what's, the, what's the mechanism? What's the consequence here, the relevant consequence? So when you have mitochondrial DNA, you have an electron transport chain, you can pump protons, and your potential is very high, okay? If you don't have mitochondrial DNA, that potential, which is essential for ion transport and many other functions in the mitochondria, drops. It's set up in a different way. It's not set up by the electron transport chain. So you can see in this figure here, uh, we're using a potential dependent dye, uh, and, it, and we're looking at its accumulation in the mitochondria using flow cytometry. So rho plus cells containing mitochondrial DNA and rho minus cells lacking mitochondrial DNA, you see a shift. Okay? So this is suggestive of, of, a, of a loss of mitochondrial potential. And showing the same data, the, cell, the wild type cells lacking mitochondrial DNA, and now comparing it to CIT4 or protein phosphatase 6 mutants lacking mitochondrial DNA, you can see it shifts back. Okay? So do we have other evidence that the potential is affected? 
And so what you're looking at is um, there's a stereotypical transcriptional response to mitochondrial DNA damage. And other groups have shown that when you increase the potential, you reverse this transcriptional response. And we also see this in our mutants. So there's two classes of genes that are, that are greatly affected by mitochondrial DNA loss. One, for reasons I can talk about later, are responsive to iron depletion. And the second is a retrograde pathway involved in activating genes in the TCA pathway. TCA, TCA cycle. And we can see if we can, this is all normalized to cells containing mitochondrial DNA, the transcriptional response of the mutants lacking the phosphatases and mitochondrial DNA is diminished, okay? Also suggesting that the potential might be higher. And finally, and this is what we think is the, is the real proximal effect uh, that's important and, and most relevant to the proliferation defects of cells lacking mitochondrial DNA is the problem with protein import. So protein import into mitochondria and there's lots of processes that, that are localized in mitochondria that are, that are essential, okay? You have to have protein import to, to have a live eukaryotic cell. And we see that the protein import defect of rho minus cells, what we, t what we do here is we tag GFP with a mitochondrial targeting sequence, and if it's not imported well, it fills the cytosol, we can't see the mitochondria, that defect is reversed. And so um, I'll, I'll sort of speed up here. We look downstream of protein phosphatase 6, at a, another conserved kinase called AMPK. Um, and we found that part of the beneficial effects provided by protein phosphate 6 deletion depends upon SNF1, which is the yeast AMPK ortholog, and that downstream deleting a repressive factor called MIG1, uh, it, it can bypass the lack of SNF1. So we get into the woods here with our yeast genetics. But um, let me just tell you what our, what our uh, wrap up with, what are our questions here? What is the relevant target of MIG-1 repression? Okay, so this is downstream in the pathway. It seems to be very relevant for what we're looking at. Are there other proteins that are phosphorylated at the mitochondria uh, that are relevant to, to controlling this potential, electrochemical potential? And how do other conserved nutrient sensing pathways determine the consequences of mitochondrial DNA loss? With that, I'll acknowledge first Gurkem, who did the, the lion's share of the work here. He's headed to NYU next year for his PhD, and some of my other students. And this work was funded by the EMBO installation grant uh, and also by Coach University College of Sciences.